So they, we're looking at Keats's odes, and we're going to look at some of his letters as well. And uh, these odes that we're going to look at, the so-called spring odes, he writes several odes that aren't the spring odes, but the spring odes are the ones we're going to look at, um, are hi among his most famous poems. And they come at a time in May uh, when I think he, uh, he's aware of the fact that he's dying or has tuberculosis and fears that he's dying at any rate. So we've already seen in his writing that he is very interested or obsessed with the topic of death and fame and poetic fame at that and the way in which the imagination will allow him immortality of some sort. And these are great themes of Western literature in general, but they don't get perceived in such existential fashion as Keats presents it. And in part that's because he believes that his feelings are related to his human nature in a more profound way than people before him would because of what we've said already about his idea of the origin of language, which again emerges in the mid-18th century in France. And, and Wordsworth perpetuates this and Keats uh, gravitates the, to this very strongly and feels very profoundly about it. That his feelings are very closely connected to his identity as a person, as a poet, and that he is able to express that because of his sensitivity to his own feelings in relation to the, his themes of life and death. And as I say, it, it recurs in his poetry. The theme does, the topic does. And we're going to see in his letters, he really writes some of the best romantic criticism on the role of the imagination and so forth. He clearly has read some of Coleridge, but he has his own thoughts. They very much dovetail with what some of his predecessors said, but that he gives his own turns of phrase that have stuck with us. So he doesn't actually write a treatise on literary criticism in any way, but in his letters, he reflects on uh, those topics and does so in a, a briefer way and a very pithy manner. So we'll look at those as well. I, I want to look at two odes in particular, Ode on a Grecian Own, Urn and um, Ode, actually I'm not, Gre Grecian Urn is going to be second. I'm going to look at Ode to Psyche first or Ode to a, no I won't do Ode to Psyche, I'll go Ode to a, a Nightingale. These are not in the right order, by the way. Nightingale's written before Grecian Urn as well. I don't know why these odes are written in this order. To Autumn comes towards the end as well. So anyway, um, most people when they read these odes, the critics have seen them to be about poetry. So the ode is directed to a Nightingale, uh, Grecian urn, but really they're as much about poetry as anything in the same way last time we saw that Lamia was about the imagination, um, a figure of the imagination or a process inside his head. Remember I talked about it as, as an, um, a closet drama in which there are types of ideas playing about being presented as characters and, and Shelley does that as well. So it's an, a type of thinking in my head. One type of thinking is tyrannical, another part is heroic, and I'm gonna play as if they were dramatic figures. And again, through in the case of Shelley, by suffering and not cursing in response, I'll overcome the judgmental type of thinking that characterizes reason. Blake is of the same mindset. Right? This is very much of an internal mental process. It's very much of a mental movement, the romantic movement. What's the right way of thinking? Should we think in a detached, analytical fashion, or should we think in a perceptive, empathetic fashion and see unity and opposite? So good and evil, we call those things opposites, but that's a matter of perspective because it's all internal anyway. So it, it, what it does with evil is it effectively dismisses evil as a real thing. 
although it does sort of identify it with the types of people that, that use logical argumentation and so forth. The philosophers tend to be described as evil in this, but really they're describing not the philosophers themselves, but more a way of thinking which is evil. We must not think that way. And they connect that furthermore with books and with, with learning uh, that it's gone before them. So they, they tend to dis the romantics tend to despise or disparage bookish learning and to prefer the intuitive developmental type of psychological thinking that we associate with children. And the child, the orphan, becomes the hero of this process of learning. And it becomes the entrenched position of the educational establishment eventually. So we have child-centered learning. So Ode to a Nightingale, I think, is written on that. Now, an ode is a type of form of literature that was well known in the ancient world, tended to be dedicated to either nat nature poems, Theocritus was the chief uh, author of those types of poetry. An, an ode is a song, by the way, in Greek. Uh, or you would find a grand odes written to Olympian games and so forth by Pindar. Pindar, P-I-N-D-A-R is the chief representative of this. Um, but come the uh, this period, uh, it tends to be a sublime type of poetry. It's associated with grandeur. And the figures that Keats writes to, there are two in particular, the Nightingale and well, actually he writes a whole series of odes, but the ones I'm looking at, the, the Nightingale and the Grecian Urn are both associated traditionally with poetry. The Nightingale is a beautiful songbird, by the way, it sings at night. You, can't, you don't see it, but you hear it, and it's, it's beautiful. And in response to this, Keats, of course, reflects on art, but also mortality. Probably unsurprisingly, he's always reflecting on these themes. The profound interest to him. And he's going to compare the eternity of art, its seemingless, uh, seeming imperviousness to the ravages of time and death, um, and then reflect on his own mortality and imminent death. As I say, he may be conscious of the fact that he has tuberculosis. He, he does contract it at some point in, during this period. Uh, might be aware of it even before that. He's not feeling well. He's, a, he's seen this before. He's nursed his brother. He's watched him die. He's watched other people die from it. And he may be coughing blood by this point. Uh, he certainly is at, at some point. At any rate, so let me read it. It's short enough, to, brief enough to do that, and so that helps as well. So, O to a Nightingale, my heart aches, and a drowsy numbness pains my sense, as though of hemlock I had drunk, or emptied some dull opiate to the drains one minute past, and leith words had sunk. Tis not through envy of thy happy lot, but being too happy in thine happiness, that thou light winged dryad of the trees in some melodious plot of beech and green and shadows numberless singest of summer in full throated ease that's the end of the first stanza i don't know why it has it put here together oh for a draft of vintage that hath been cooled a long age in the deep delved earth tasting of flora and the country green dance and provencal song and sunburnt mirth. Actually, I can't tolerate this trend. This is <laughs> because it Keats odes. Let me get a quote ode to a nightingale here, where it actually has the stanzas separate. There we go. My apologies. I couldn't cope with the terrible spacing. Oh, for a beaker full of the warm south, full of the true. The blushful hippocrine with beaded bubbles winking at the brim and purple-stained mouth, that I might drink 
and leave the world unseen, and with thee fade away into the forest dim. Fade far away, dissolve, and quite forget what thou among the leaves hast never known. The weariness, the fever, and the fret here, where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs, where youth grows pale and specter thin and dies, where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden-eyed despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy. Doesn't want to move there. Though the dull brain perplexes and retards, already with thee. Tender is the night, and haply the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry fays. But here there is no light, save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet, nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs. But in embalmed darkness guess each sweet, wherewith the seasonable month endows the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild, white hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading violets covered up in leaves, and mid May's eldest child, the coming musk rose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunts of flies on summer eves. Darkling I listen, and for many a time I have been half in love with easeful death, called him soft names in many amused rhyme, to take into the air my quiet breath. Now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain, while thou, while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem become a sod. Thou wast not born for death, immortal bird, no hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the same self same song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth when Sick for home, she stood in tears amid the alien corn, the same that oft times hath charmed magic casements, opening on the foam of perilous seas and fairy lands forlorn. Forlorn? The very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu, the fairy, the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed to do, deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy Plaintive anthem fades past the near meadows, meadows over the still stream, up the hillside, and now tis buried deep in the next valley glades. Was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? So as it says here, uh, context 1819, spring, Charles Brown mentions that a nightingale had built her nest near, her, uh, near his house and he was listening regularly in delight to the beauty of the nightingale song. It really is a beautiful song if you've never heard it. I can keep the numbers there. So clearly a reflection on the themes that I've already talked about of mortality and so forth. And what we have is a greeting of the spirit what Keats calls in his letters, a, a greet, the greeting of the spirit, the human spirit that goes out in delight to things that are beautiful. And the nightingale is beautiful. Its song is beautiful. It's a song that he met, later mentions has been heard throughout ages and has led people to delight. It's not the same nightingale. It's a nightingale, but all nightingales are the same in this sense. They don't have personhood. They don't have individuality. There is, in a sense, that's, it's a different nightingale, but they don't, we don't have a sense 
that there's any loss when the nightingale dies. When an individual person has been lost, the likes of that person will never be seen again on earth. It's a very different experience and he's aware of this fact that a human life is a different thing than a bird. So the bird for all of its beauty and for all of the ways that it represents the beauty of the poet does not represent him insofar as its de death does not seem to trouble it. And there's nothing lost in the nightingale's song as the ages pass. It remains just as beautiful and no different now than it was, as far as we know at any rate, from the time when Ruth was weeping in the alien corn or listened to by uh, past generations. No sense of that. the spiritual terror that comes from human mortality, or at least the one that Keats perceives, because he does seem to be very aware of it and troubled by it. He's not consoled by the Christian faith. He is not one. He's most, he's most uh, explicitly not one. We'll come to that in his letters. So now he deals with the problem and he's not going to be consoled by the idea of a celebration of life. He's going to die and then they'll have a celebration of life. We'll all stand around. What a great guy Keats was and we'll pretend he wouldn't want us to be sad right now. He would want us to have happy thoughts of him. So let's stand together and think happy thoughts of Mr. Keats. He's not having that. He recognizes that there's something that is lost there and an individual life has been lost. Let's acknowledge that. Let's not pretend that there isn't something different than the passing of the dog. As much as we love the dog, the dog's not a person. You can get a new dog. You will love the new dog. The dog will love you. And you can even call him the same name if you want. You probably wouldn't want to because you've personified that other dog. And you're not going to call Rover Rover again. Give him a different name. Nobody calls their dog Rover anymore, needless to say. So I'm not triggering anyone with the loss of their beloved pet. Um, but he is troubled by this. His heart aches. And he, he cites the drowsing numbness. And the drowsing numbness comes not from drinking too much. He'll cite drinking, but it's rather from feeling the immortality of the song of the bird, which he himself lacks. So it's by comparison. Now, if it really is about a nightingale, then that would be one thing. I think it's about, again, a little bit more abstractly about poetry. It's a poem about poetry. Others have thought so as well. T.S. Eliot thinks it so, and many, most critics think that this is really a poem dedicated to what poetry actually is. And if it is about feelings, then how does it attain the grandeur that we associate with poetry? Well, one way is that it's actually not about feelings and the romantics are completely wrong and poetry doesn't do what they're pausing, but they really think that it is. And it always has been furthermore, because I think Keats would tend to agree with Wordsworth that all good poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feeling and we've just made progress on what those feelings are to a more uh, contemporary view than what was once there and uh, we've moved forward and onwards but still that's what it is and it is so it is as if he had drunk it as though of hemlock I had drunk remember this is what Socrates was given when he was given the choice of either leave the city be banished, be exiled, or drink the hemlock. I would rather drink the hemlock, he says. Or an opiate. Makes you hopeful. You drink it. Like opium. And towards forgetfulness. Know that it's lethe words. That's the river in the underworld, the classical underworld where you are 
the souls are dipped and they lose their individuality and they forget who they are and then they can be reincarnated, by the way. And it's not through envy, but being too happy in thine happiness because the, 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 the songbird that sings that way sings a song of such joy and beauty that he cannot participate in it because he has an individual sense of self. He can't get rid of that. Shelley seems to have been able to get rid of it. He says that he's able to think sufficiently abstractly to say that we're all individual modifications of the one mind. So I, you, he, she, they, they don't matter. It's all one. Uh, Keats is not there. He has too strong a sense of his individuality to be satisfied with Shelley's solution. And that's why he writes better poetry. It is. He, he's a man who feels a sense of mortality. And we can identify with that more than we can with Shelley, who's far more um, consistent with his premises but he's less relatable, to use jargon these days. Can't relate to this guy. I mean, some can, but it, again, it's, it's, it's a very intellectualized way of looking at things, and Shelley's able to do that, and most of us know. But Keats, we can identify with. But So he sings like a light-winged dryad of the trees, sure. But for Keats' part, let's have a little glass of wine. A draft of vintage, cooled, red wine that I will be able to drink with beaded bubbles and a purple stained mouth in order why to drink and again leave the world unseen and with the fade away into the forest gym. He wants to fade away with no pain. Repeated reference to pain. He's thinking about the pain. Tuberculosis coughing up of blood looks pretty painful. He does realize he's going to die, but he wants to die without all the terror that comes with it. Why to fade away, far away, dissolve? So when I say this, although it's a reflection on poetry, the reflection on poetry can't divorce itself from the individual who's dying. It keeps coming back to that. And so it's at odds with his theory of poetry. And there's a tension there in the poems, which makes Keats so uh, so uh, popular because he can't he's he's not as committed to his romanticism as he would like to be fade far away dissolve and quite forget what thou among the leaves have never known how oh, you've never known that the nightingale what the weariness the fever and the fret here where men sit and hear each other groan, where palsy shakes a few sad last gray hairs, where the youth grows pale and spectered in, thin and dies, just like his brother Tom. I'm going to watch people deteriorate in front of me and, and suffer. Do animals suffer? They suffer pain. Do they seem to have an existential answer? Are they terrified? Not that way. They're not. Where but to think is to be full of sorrow and leaden eye despairs, where beauty cannot keep her lustrous eyes, or new love pine at them beyond tomorrow, even beauty fades. So nothing good remains, it all goes. Whereas the nightingale seems to never to express the lament. It's just joy, delight, beauty. How wonderful. I would like to do that says Mr. Keats. I can't do that because I'm torn by the suffering of life. I find Mr. Keats, for that reason, so attractive as a writer, more realistic. Away, away, for I will fly to thee, not charioted by Bacchus and his pards, but on the viewless wings of poesy, so Bacchus and his pards, Bacchus is the wine god, but he's also the god of poetry. The Bacchanalia. Uh, but on the viewless wings of it, what are the viewless wings of poesy? Is it the progressive universal poetry that Schlegel talked about? The viewless wings, so something that has no form? 
but it's been universalized, abstracted from all form. It's moving from material feelings towards a more and more emancipated human spiritual expression. Not entirely sure, but it's a, it's a terrific phrase. Viewless wings of poesy. Though the dull brain perplexes and retards, the brain does, but the mind doesn't. Already with thee. So intellectually, I'm there. My brain's here, but my spirit is with you. I'm thinking about you. I can empathize. I can project my thoughts into this. Imagine what it's like to be a nightingale. Happily, the queen moon is on her throne, clustered around by all her starry face. Gets this probably from Shakespeare's uh, um, Midsummer Night's Dream. But here there is no light. Save what from heaven is with the breezes blown through verdurous glooms and winding mossy ways. Now, at this point, it's all imagining, and it's been imagining from the beginning. That's how it will, you know, he'll say, do I awake or do I sleep? Am I imagining the whole thing? He might be, actually. It's a, it's a speculative venture, the entire thing. You can imagine him walking around, he's in the dark, or, but is he actually in the dark? Or is he just imagining the sound of the bird and the associations with the bird? And that bird's been here, and it was the same bird that was heard back then. And it's, it's empathizing throughout and giving a sort of a quasi a narrative that goes with it. I cannot see what flowers are at my feet nor what soft incense hangs upon the boughs, but in embalmed darkness already, the embalmed, he's dead. Yes, each sweet wherewith the seasonable month endows, the grass, the thicket, and the fruit tree wild, white hawthorn and the pastoral eglantine, fast fading, fading violets, violets a symbol of desire, a desire which fades quickly, covered up in leaves, leaves, the leaves of autumn that fall, and mid-May's eldest child, the coming musk rose, full of dewy wine, the murmurous haunt of flies on summer's eaves. Darkling I listen. He got this word from Milton when he talks about a nightingale in his uh, poetry. Darkling I listen. And for many a time I've been half in love with easeful death. Called him soft name. Speaks to death as if it were his beloved. It's going to claim him. Rather than be terrified, let me take him back. To take into the air my quiet breath, now more than ever seems it rich to die, to cease upon the midnight with no pain. Why now? Because TB is going to give him a different outcome. How about I'll do it right now then? An easeful death. Assisted suicide longing for that release that will embrace the thing that he can't run away from and will come on his terms then. To cease upon the midnight with no pain while thou art pouring forth thy soul abroad in such an ecstasy. Ecstasy is literally to stand apart from oneself. Ecstasis, to stand apart. You're, you're, you're uh, an experience, uh, an out-of-body experience. That, that's what he longs for. And he already is experiencing, as he hears the nightingale, he's forgetting John Keats. That's the power of beauty. It makes us forget ourselves. Right? We enjoy the object. In this case, it's not an object. It's a sound, but so beautiful that he is united with the beauty. Forgets his mortality. But he can't do it for long. Still wouldst thou sing, and I have ears in vain, to thy high requiem, what is, which is sung at a funeral, become a sod. He's going to become dirt. Came from ashes to ashes, dust to dust. He came from the dust to go back to the dust. Again, there's this back and forth. I'm mortal, you're immortal. This is great, not for me. Thou wast not born for death, immortal birds. No hungry generations tread thee down. The voice I hear this passing night was heard in ancient days by emperor and clown. Perhaps the selfsame song that found a path through the sad heart of Ruth. 
So again, or in the magic casements, charmed opening on the foam of perilous seas and fairy lands forlorn. But again, the, there's the uh, nightingale is said to have immortality, but its more, immortality only comes at the cost of individuality. He wants, like Shelley, to lose his personhood. path to that is through oblivion. Destruction of the self. And forlorn, as soon as he utters that word, the very word is like a bell to toll me back from thee to my soul self. Adieu, the fancy cannot cheat so well as she is famed adieu. Deceiving elf. Adieu, adieu, thy plaint of, plaint of anthem fades and then it fades Flee, it flees the point, was it a vision or a waking dream? Fled is that music. Do I wake or sleep? Who knows? From the beginning, was he awake or was he dreaming? But the mortality, he's left with the mortality. He's left with the dread and the possibility of the pain. And, to some degree, with a type of poetry that may not last either. Will anyone actually like this poem? Will it, will, be, will it be appreciated as a great work of art? It, will it be an expression of a great poet which Keats thought he had the gift to be considered? So, and I guess the answer for us is yes, it is a great poem. That's how it's been received. Rightly so, I think. I think it's a great poem. Do you have any thoughts about it? It's a, I think it's beautiful. Note his, his, at this point, he's still, he's a very young man, but his skill as a poet is terrific for such a young man. One wonders what would have become of Keats had he grown and lived longer. I don't know if he would have become any greater because of the premises with, with which he begins. On, on feeling. I, I think that it's made for lyric poetry, and I'm not sure it sustains itself much beyond that. It's not a foundation for great reflective thinking. And so they try the closet drama. It's about mental processes. They try the lyric poem. It's about mental processes. They try the epic. It's about mental processes. Okay, but really, can you really write poetry about mental processes uh, that people want to read at great length? The answer is not really. Doesn't, the form doesn't sustain it. It's not dramatically very powerful. It's an interesting idea, okay. But it can't be, I've actually seen it put on stage, um, some of these closet dramas. Even though they're not supposed to be, I've seen them try and do it, and it doesn't really work, as you can imagine. Uh, to try and dramatize something where there's no action. A drama is an action. There is no action. These are thoughts relating to other thoughts. Um, does it really allow itself to go beyond the bounds of a lyric as a, a form of poetry? And I, I don't think it does. So it's really good in the lyrical bouts. It's great in the odes. Anything more lengthy, it's just not going to work. Wordsworth will write the prelude. It sort of works because of the greatness of the poet, I guess. But in general, that's about it. And he never writes the grand epic that he plans on writing. And I think it's not possible. The theme's not really up to it. Um, your own comments, thoughts? Do you want me to go on to the next ode? I shall do so then. Ode on a no oh, melancholy nightingale, Grecian, and we'll go with that one. Terrific. It actually has it rightly set out. So this is considered a, c a companion poem to the one we just did. 
uh, and I think you'll see why in a second. But so also on poetry, but now the object is not something that he hears, but something that he sees. And that matters. It's also on a Grecian urn, and we've already talked about the connection between Greek art to sublimity. And in particular, there are debates between uh, Winkelmann and Lessing in Germany about the relative merits of poetry versus statuary and so forth. And Winkelmann is a strong advocate of the Greek statuary and the sublime grandeur. The still grandeur is his phrase, stille Größe of Greek art. He goes on about this and there's very much of a, in Germany in the 18th century, a great embrace of Greek culture, not Roman Greek. So it, the classicism in Germany is strongly connected with an embrace of Greek literature. But what is it about Greek literature as opposed to Roman? It's more original. It's not derivative. It's closer to nature. It's more, it's just simply better. Even the Romans acknowledged it. Why would we not root classicism in the real thing rather than the derivations of it? But by so doing, it's moving away from Christianity because the vehicle for Western Christendom is through Rome. The, the Western Roman, the Roman Empire adopted Christianity as its official religion. Greece predated that. Now, Eastern Christendom was written in Greek and it, it more influential, but in the West, not so. So when we go back to Greek literature in the West, it tends to be more orient or orientated towards paganism. And it was so in Germany as well. But the poetry is better. The Greek, the Greek literature is simply better. And the Greek language is more subtle and supple. And uh, so it's hard to disagree with it just simply on, on that level. But I think that the motivation for it is to some degree to get out of the Western Christian tradition towards something that's more, in their view, more fundamental, more rooted in human nature, which is in feeling human origins. Anyway, the Ode on a Grecian Urn, and the context that for that, once again, it's probably the Elgin Marbles. He goes, and I mentioned these uh, when we introduced Keats to begin with, that Keats saw the Elgin Marbles and was delighted by them, but not entirely persuaded that the um, Greek art was as grand as his friend Benjamin Robert Hayden said it was not convinced that this, of the superiority of Greek art to anything that was written today. Keats is a progressive universal poet, so he's not going to buy that argument. We've moved on in some ways here. And so here we get an encounter between, again, the greeting spirit of Keats and the urn. And he immediately addresses, addresses it in terms of a thou. So he's speaking to the urn. Now, with re respect to the theme of mortality and death, what is an urn there to do to, her, to hold somebody's ashes, a dead person's ashes? That's what the urn has in it. So again, he's addressing something related to death, just like the nightingale, immediately here again. So, thou still unravished bride of quietness. Note the connection to silence in this poem. Very strong. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time. Sylvan historian who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. What leaf fringed legend haunts about thy shape of deities or mortals or of both in Tempe or the dales of Arcady? What men or gods are these? What maidens loath? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Therefore, ye soft pipes, play on, not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, pipe to the spirit, ditties of no tone. Fair youth, beneath the trees thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss. Though winning near the goal, yet do not grieve, she cannot fade. Though 
thou hast not thy bliss, forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. Ah, happy, happy boughs that cannot shed your leaves, nor ever bid the spring adieu, and happy melodist unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new, more happy love, more happy, happy love, forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young, all breathing human passion far above that leaves a heart high sorrowful and cloyed, a burning forehead and a parching tongue. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leads thou that heifer lowing at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed? What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk, this pious morn? And little town, thy streets forevermore will silent be, and not a soul to tell why thou art desolate can e'er return. O Attic shape, fair attitude, with breed of marble men and maidens overwrought, with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou, silent form, dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity. Cold pastoral, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man, to whom thou sayest, beauty is truth, truth beauty, that is all you, need, you know on earth and all you need to know. So this is his most famous poem. Oh, to Nightingale famous, this even more so. I spent, I can't tell you how long on this poem. As a grad student, I studied for this for about a year. When I, not just the poem, not reading the poem, but the critics on the poem, because this, this poem is the test case for literary theories. There's so, so many literary theories that have used this poem as a basis for showing why this theoretical perspective is better than the other ones. So it, be, so it wasn't the poem so much, it was that it has been the, the subject matter of large numbers of important 20th century literary theories. After a while, it's a great poem. I like it more now. I didn't like it after spending so long on it. Yes. Uh, breed is, yeah, the breed, it could be a play on language like breeding, but I think it's more related to the, um, at the top of an urn, Yes. Uh, it's, is it going to show me? It's the pattern at the top. Oh, it doesn't have it there. It doesn't have a breed. Uh, does this have one? Yeah, here. Oh, stop it. There. That's a breed. Oh, okay. It's a pattern sort of interwoven in the top. That's the breed. What is the significance of that? Is it supposed to be like circular and not like the final type thing and not ending? Well, he says that it's overwrought. So at first, he's delighted with it. You have to see progression in the poem. And each stanza, I suspect he's describing a different scene. So. If you think about the way urns are, they're on a plinth in a museum and you look at it and if you're bothered enough to keep looking at it, you walk around the circumference of it and you see different scenes in it. And I think that's what he's doing. The person is looking at it, okay, and he's asking questions. So now he sees marble men and maidens overwrought. He's dissatisfied with it. It's too, but at first he's only delighted with it, although he's puzzled by it. He begins by asking all sorts of questions, but the questions all relate to something about it that it won't speak back. It's quiet. It's silent. And it's grand. 
And when he says, what leaf fringe legend, this is the breed again, but in this case, it has a legend and the legend uh, from the Latin is something to be read. There might be it, it written in Greek or Latin around it. It's a legend. It's something that we read in there. Maybe there are words there in the midst of the leaves. What, what does that say? And about the shape of deities or mortals or both, is it here or is it here? What men's or gods are these? What maidens loath? I don't understand the scene in front of me, but I have all sorts of questions. I'm fascinated by this, and you can't respond to me, surprisingly. <laughs> A uh, piece of marble doesn't speak, and yet that's not its virtue. It's not supposed to speak. It's silent grandeur, it, and the silence is emphasized. I mean, hyperemphasized. You're still, as in perhaps not yet, or still in the sense of it's not making a noise, and it's a bride of quietness, foster child of silence and slow time. How slow? Eternally slow. Strong emphasis on the silence of the urn. And the silence of the urn plays a sweeter melody than the herd melodies. Again, comparative. The poet makes heard songs, sounds, just like the nightingale. So before he was talking about the nightingale and the beauty of its song, which he hears, now he, uh, he has a different figure of poetic genius, but it doesn't make any noise. And it represents eternity nonetheless, just like the nightingale did. But yes, the breed, that's the breed. It's the interwoven pattern at the top of this. And it's, it, he mentioned the marble men and maidens at the outset. Are they gods? Are they men? There's some sort of, some, but now it's overwrought. And it's trodden weed. And it, the, the silent form at first, it, that was, he, was, he, was, he bought into the idea that silence was a representation of sublimity. But now he's not so happy with that. Not that transcendence doesn't appeal to a mortal man like me. I need a personal transcendence. This is impersonal transcendence. Just like the bird is impersonal transcendence. As a Christian, I see it as a man who wants, as a hunger in his heart for, for a personal transcendent God. I mean, Maybe I'm reading too much in it, but I think there's a, there's a, a, a hole in Keats's heart, like it is in all people who know that death is, there's something wrong with death and something lacking in their selves, and they look for substitutes for it, often in, uh, in various forms. It can be any form, actually. For, for Keats, it's in the realm of beauty. And yet all the forms of beauty that he sees for in front of him, the nightingale song, the urn's grandeur, a perfection of Greek art, Shakespeare's poetic fame, which he longs for himself, it leaves him feeling empty. It's not enough. He loves the transcendence, but there's no imminence. There's no person, personal dimension to it. So it's a, for me, it's a crying out for the thing that he denies which is the existence of God. He laments what it doesn't have. So beauty draws him towards transcendence. But the transcendent forms that he meets can't relate to his mortality and to his personal individual identity his unique individual identity. When Tom Keats died, when Fanny Braun dies, a person dies of which there will never be another like that. They, he recognizes this. And he wants that from transcendence as well. It has to fit that piece. And, and so again, he's not satisfied with what Mr. Shelley presented to us. And his poetry on poetry 
reflects a dissatisfaction with the poetic theory that he himself holds, nonetheless. But he, he, there's a dissatisfaction with it, I, I sense. In those two great poems, there's a deep ambivalence about it. And, and part of the, the paradox that's in it is why it makes it so appealing. You keep coming back to it, but there's no resolution. So even more so, look at the ending here, when at the end it says that, you, you know, you're, he calls it a cold pastoral, because when this old generation shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours, a friend to man. Sure, you represent beauty, and beauty always appeals to every generation. To whom thou sayest, and here's the perplexing line, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. In certain versions of the poem, this quotation extends to the whole of the, latter, the last two lines. That is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Is that what the urn says? That all, or is it because if it's not, and it, it's as we have it here on the screen, then it's Keats that says it, that that's what the urn says. So does the urn say that, or is that what Keats says the urn says? So it depends on where the punctuation marks are. Does the urn say beauty is truth, be truth, beauty? Or does Keats conclude that's what it says? Reading into it, speaking on its behalf, that's what we currently have here, in which case, it's slightly different. And that divergence, different manuscripts, critics love that stuff. You can write all sorts of academic articles on the significance of the ending. And uh, none other than T.S. Eliot thought that the ending was overly tight and, a, and, and was a blemish on a beautiful poem. He said he wrecked the whole thing with the ending. Because everything that's said thus far is, dis so he started with beauty, beauty, dissatisfaction with this cold pastoral and then you come with this conclusion that beauty is truth truth beauty that's all you know on earth and all you need to know question question oh you don't even need to know the answer to the questions doesn't really seem to fit the poem it says it's overly forced trying to come up with a resolution that the poem itself does not actually lead us to. Is Eliot right? I think so. I think he's right. It, it's overly forced. Is he aware of the fact that it's overly forced? Is it a failure on his part or is it, is it a deliberately overstated, overly tight conclusion? And that's what I think is the case. He deliberately overstates it. Because that's, that's what the urn says. And that's not going to satisfy it. You say all my problems are solved. I still have problems. If that makes any sense. But anyway, there's there, you can see why it's 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 to some degree about the same sorts of things, but it's a different artistic object which represents different things. Anyway, if there are no comments or questions about this, no. Yes. Very good. Vanity, vanity. Yes. It's very, um, even though they're about um, art, it also seems to dovetail with wisdom literature. Yes, it does. Uh, unsurprisingly, wisdom literature meditates very much on death and on the vanity of earthly pursuits and so forth. Ecclesiastes in particular, you're right. Job's about suffering. Proverbs more about fruitful living. But this about the the weariness and the fret and the futility and the uselessness of life's pursuits, right? And that's, it, you're right. 
Very much so. Dissatisfaction and a sense of a lack of fulfillment. And that is a path of wisdom. So your 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 life is not meant for this earth only. There's a there, there's more than this. Everything you're striving after will not be met in this world. There will be it will have to be fulfilled outside of your capacities to find meaning and purpose in life. There's a transcendent meaning and purpose in life that will fulfill that, but and your leanings and your longings and your strivings are are leaning towards it, but they're not going to ever get there. Ecclesiastes is very good at talking about you try, try this. Now I've tried that and try, try this. I've tried that. Try this. Now I've tried that, and I watch and I've tried that, and yeah, that none of them lead anywhere. It doesn't mean life is meaningless. It means that fulfillment doesn't come from us. That's what it means. That's wisdom. Because if it's just life is meaningless, that sounds like hopelessness. That's not the message of Ecclesiastes. Sorry? Nihilism. Is, what, what's the difference between that and nihilism? It's the, but the tone is not nihilistic. Let's look at some of the letters. Um, I said to you at the outset, oops, what on earth did I do there? <laughs> uh, I don't want to do that. So that was obviously the wrong button. Oh, that's the wrong button again. So let's, oh, there we go. I cannot exist without poetry, without eternal poetry. This is the one I want. Letter to Benjamin Bailey, 22nd of September of November 1817. If you read, Keats is good to read at the end of the whole Romantics course because he reflects on things that he's read in Coleridge, he's read Wordsworth, he's thinking about the topics and he pulls them out and he does so in these letters in a very pithy way. As I said, but I'm running in my head into a subject that I, I'm certain I could not do justice to under five years study in three volumes at Tavo, forever long to be talking about the imagination famous line, I am certain of nothing but of the holiness of the heart's affections and the truth of imagination. Note the first, the holiness of the heart's affection and the truth of the imagination, which is reflecting on feelings. What the imagination seizes as beauty must be truth, just where we just left off whether it existed before or not. For I have the same idea of all our passions as of love. They are all in their sublime creative of essential beauty. In a word, you may know my favorite speculation by my first book and the little song I sent in my last, which is a representation from the fancy of the probable mode of operating in the, these matters. The imagination may be compared to Adam's dream. He awoke and found it truth. I am the more zealous in this affair because I have never yet been able to perceive how anything can be known for truth by consecutive reasoning. Going after the Enlightenment again, the usual whipping boy. And yet it must be, can it be that even the greatest philosopher ever arrived at his goal without putting aside numerous objections? However it may be, oh, for a life of sensations rather than of thoughts. So it's the poet versus the philosopher. It is a vision in the form of youth, a shadow of reality to come. And this consideration has further convinced me, for it has come as auxiliary to another favorite speculation of mine, that we shall enjoy ourselves here after by having what we called happiness on earth repeated in a finer tone and so repeated. He's thinking about life after death thinking about life being a repetition of what we're doing and yet still better. He has hopeful visions of the future. And yet such a fate can only befall those who delight in sensation rather than hunger as you do after truth. So how do you get to the truth? You have to go after delight. 
Remember the teaching and delight? We come at it through the medium of delight and that gets to the truth. But if you go directly at the truth, we miss something of this. So Adam's dream will hear, do here and seems to me uh, conviction that imagination and its imperial reflection is the same as human life and its spiritual repetition. Second letter of worthy study on negative capability. This relates to progressive universal poetry, by the way. So this is to his brothers in 1817 and again. I must crave your pardon for not having written ere this. The excellence of every art is its intensity, capable of making all disagreeables evaporate from their being in close prox relationship with beauty and truth. Examine King Lear and you will find this exemplified throughout. But in this picture we have unpleasantness without any momentous depth of speculation excited in which to bury its repulsiveness. Um, the picture is larger than Christ rejected. I dined with Hayden the Sunday after you left and had a very pleasant day and I dined too for I've been out too much lately with Horace Smith and met his two brothers with Hill and Kingston and one Dubois. They only serve to convince me how superior humor is to wit in respect to enjoyment. These men say things which make one start without making one feel. They're all alike. Their manners are alike. They all know fashionables. They have a mannerism in their very eating and drinking in their handling a decanter. They talked of Keen, who's a great, the great um, actor of the day, and his low company. Would I were with that company instead of yours, said I to myself. I know such like acquaintance will never do for me. And yet, I'm going to Reynolds on Wednesday. Brown and Dilka walked with me and back from the Christmas pantomime. I had not a dispute, but a disquisition with Dilka on various subjects, which several things dovetailed in my mind. And at once it struck me what quality went to form a man of achievement, especially in literature, and which Shakespeare possessed so enormously, I mean negative cap capability, which is when man is, in, is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching after fact and reason. Coleridge, for instance, would let go by a fine, isolated verisimilitude caught from the penetralium of mystery from being incapable of remaining content with half knowledge. So Coleridge is juxtaposed with, with Shakespeare. Shakespeare had this ability to negate himself. Forget Shakespeare the man. He would not uh, read into things. He wouldn't impose his views on things. He would let them come to him. This is the reason why Shakespeare was able, he is elsewhere called by Keats, myriad-minded Shakespeare. All of his characters come to life because he lets them be themselves. He doesn't project himself on every character like Milton does. Milton has a very strong ideal. And you can see you can hear Milton's voice in every character. He has a very strong puritanical sense of righteousness being the main theme of everything. It's always there. His voice is very strong. Uh, for for uh, Shakespeare, he his characters jump off the page just like Dickens. And that's because he has what Keats calls negative capability. And Coleridge, and the reason for it though is because he doesn't reach after, after uh, reason. It's a very strange observation there. He always wants to explain things. He always has to understand things. He doesn't just delight in the sensation. I don't think he, I, th I think it's very odd, but this phrase is famous. We hate poetry that has a palpable design upon us. And if we do not agree, seems to put its hand in its breeches pocket. It turns away from us. Enough of you. Poetry should be great and unobtrusive, a thing which enters into one's soul and does not startle it or amaze it with itself, but with its subject. Modern poets differ from the Elizabethans in this. Each of the moderns, like an elector of Hanover, governs his petty, petty state and 
knows how many straws are swept daily from the causeway and all his dominions and has a continual itching that all the housewives should have their coppers well scoured. The ancients were emperors of vast provinces. They'd only heard of the remote ones and scarcely cared to visit them. I will cut all this. I have no more. I will have no more of Wordsworth or Hunt in particular. Why should we be of the tribe of Manasseh when we can wander with Esau? Okay, this one, finally. I compare human life to a large mansion of many apartments. Remember in the, Jesus talks about the kingdom and a place of many mansions. I compare human life to a large mansion of many apartments, two of which I can only describe, the doors of the rest being as yet shut upon me. The first we stepped into we called the infant or thoughtless chamber, in which we remain as long as we do not think. This is, the song, this is of innocence, by the way, what, what Blake calls innocence. We remain there a long while, and notwithstanding the doors of the second chamber remain wide open, showing a bright appearance, we care not to hasten to it, but are at length imperceptibly impelled by the awakening of the thinking principle within us. We no sooner get into the second chamber when we start thinking and have experience, we think of things and compare and reflect on things, which I call the chamber of maiden thought. Then we become intoxicated with the light in the atmosphere. We see nothing but pleasant wonders and think of delaying there forever in delight. However, among the effects of this, this breathing is father of is that tremendous sharpening of one's vision into the heart and nature of man of convincing one's nerves that the world is full of misery and heartbreak, pain, sickness, and oppression, whereby this chamber of maiden thought becomes gradually darkened. And at the same time, on all sides of it, many doors are set open, but all dark, all leading to dark passages. We see not the balance of good and evil. We are in a mist. We are now in that state. We feel the burden of the mystery. To this point, was Wordsworth come as far as I conceive when he wrote Tintern Abbey. And it seems to me that his genius is explorative of those dark passages. Now, if we live and go on thinking, we too shall explore them. He is a genius and superior to us insofar as he can more than we make discoveries and shed light in them. Here I must think Wordsworth is deeper than Milton. And then he goes on, and I've, it's cut out. Milton was caught up in his Christian thinking at a time when they'd barely got rid of cod pieces and such disgraces, he says. Cod pieces like the, you know what a cod piece is? Shakespearean actors. Milton is talking about this, but he was a product of his time. But Wordsworth is superior to him by the grand march of intellect. That's his phrase. The grand march of intellect is what moves uh, Milton away, or Wordsworth away from Milton, and we from that. It's the grand march of intellect. We've emancipated ourselves from the prejudices of the past. Again, it's progressive universal poetry. But again, he, here in this final letter, and I'm, I'm sorry that it's cut off and he's only given us an excerpt, he talks about this, this uh, period of feeling when we're childhoods, but no thinking, and then we start thinking. Again, it's the same genealogy of, of writing and speaking that we've already articulated there. Anyway, that's enough and I'm